Thank you for joining us for another episode of Channel Revelations. I'm Ethan Fox, and I'm here with Mikhail Sheldon. And today we'll be spending a couple of hours talking to the guys about some interesting topics and ancient civilizations. And as I always say on these shows, I don't discuss the topics or any of the questions with Mikhail ahead of time, although she is a trans channel and will be speaking directly to the guides, just so that there is no information interfering with her conscious mind. I don't share the topics with her beforehand. So uh, we can get started whenever you're ready. Let's bring in whoever is relevant to start. We are the Council of Nine. Okay. And um, I assume the Council of Light is always there in the background as well? For whatever purpose is necessary. Okay. And, uh, and why the Council of Nine, to nine today? What, what's the difference between the Council of Nine, other than obviously Ninth Dimension, I assume, versus... Uh, well, in the Council of Light, their 13th dimension? Well, the 13th dimension is a developing area of the universe, not, we would say, fully accessible in terms of its Akashic wisdom, only because the universe is always expanding. And so what we notice right now is that that expansion is facilitating the, the creation of a 13th dimension, um, some of which... Uh, those on the council are participating within. However, we would say the council is more dominant a 12th dimensional resonance than 13th. Um, when we call in a council that is defined by a certain dimension, such as the council of nine, it is often an indication that we are drawing from the Akashic records the equivalent of ninth dimensional access and wisdom, uh, often because it is something relevant to the topics at hand and, and often uh, easier understandable by those at a certain threshold of consciousness. And is the, thir well, there, so there are 12 dimensions and then a 13th dimension is currently developing by the sounds of it. Now, is the 13th dimension a higher octave of the first 12? Uh, when you say a higher octave, uh, we assume you're speaking of, of frequency or, or range. And, and yes, we could say that. Uh, it's not an easy thing for us to define in, in terms of a, a physical manifestation because any time that there is expansion happening throughout the universe, that expansion is being drawn from all dimensions simultaneously, meaning the creative force, uh, co-creative force, in other words, of, of all of those in the universe are um, somehow merged together in order to facilitate a, a grander expression of that creation. And certainly that 13th dimension is evidence that the universe itself has prepared a, a new container, we'll say, uh, for those who are ready to experience a, a different... Um, we'll say vehicle of consciousness in terms of options that have been available throughout this universe previously. And is the 13th dimension currently the highest of all the dimensions that are available? In, in this universe, yes. Okay. So when we say universe, are we speaking of a vibratory or vibrational universe or are we referring to the Milky Way or the, the galaxies that are in this range? Well, from a scientific viewpoint, certainly there are certain things that could be included in the definition of a universe, the Milky Way, for example. But any time that, that we are defining a specific area of the universe, uh, we want you to keep in mind that it's, it's very difficult to put it into a box. In other words, yes, um, vibrationally speaking, what we're looking at is some semblance of commonality in terms of, of frequency, uh, creative energy, form of manifestation, uh, how the beings in that dimension are choosing to, to resonate, for example, but also um, how they are able to put what was before uh, into some construct of something new. And, and you here on planet earth are doing this all of the time so so you you are not creating from nothingness we we've spoken of this in many past transmissions the foundation of all creation is what came before it 
And in a 13th dimensional energy or in a universe, for example, what we're truly defining is, is the confines of a creative symmetry. Uh, in other words, an expression of energy that is of likeness to itself, but has deviated from its original form, still containing some of the origins of what it is created from. <laughs> so, so anytime that we are looking at a universe, we're actually looking at the microcosm of a race or, 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 or we'll say the macrocosm of a race or, or a planet, for example. Um, if you look at humanity, you are all unique in your expression, yet you have all um, come from the same origins and have taken that creative spark, in other words, and made it your own. You, you've added to it, you've deviated from it in some logical way. Yet if we were to look at all of you, uh, we would see very similar characteristics in terms of your physical DNA, for example, uh, and, and the history that you are working from. The spiral of time comes into this consideration, uh, which is another uh, topic that we are often addressing. Uh, the spiral of time operates within each universe distinctly differently, meaning it's, it's containing the energy that is uh, prominent and necessary to the beings that are working with it. Think of the, we don't even want to call it universe, we'll call it, think of God, think of uh, all that is as being so massive that a logical organizational system had to come into being. And that's ultimately what the definition of a universe is. It's, it's God's way of organizing all of creation that is taking place in different frames of time or, or dimensional realities uh, within itself. If uh, 13 is the, the highest dimension currently available in this universe, then um, I, help me understand, I've heard a lot of other channels and people in the spiritual space referencing higher dimensions beyond 13. What, what is it that they're uh, connecting to then? It's hard for us to put one explanation to what others are perceiving. But, but think of dimension uh, as being a container that is drawing onto itself other expressions throughout the uh, the universe that causes it to expand. With this definition in mind, we might say that if someone is tapping into what they perceive a 26th dimensional reality, it's coming from outside of this universe, meaning something or someone in the 12th dimension is, is needing to tap into the multiverse. And in order to move into or, or create even a 13th dimensional container is drawing from that multiverse or another universe other than the one it resides within. It isn't easy necessarily, we think, for those on planet Earth to actually fully tap into a multiverse um, vibration because it does require a, a certain type of energetic structure that is able to expand beyond itself and retrieve beyond its own expression. Uh, so, so sometimes we notice that um, those that are tapping into this energy are doing so with the support and the assistance of 12th to 13th dimensional beings, um, assistants, we might call them, that aren't necessarily um, um, apt to relate to a dimension in this universe beyond the 13th, but nonetheless is drawing from the Akashic records of another universe necessary to support this one. I see. So, so it is possible in theory to have dimensions beyond 13, just not in our universal experience at the moment. Well, it is possible in this one. It has just not occurred yet. I see. Yes. Okay. Now, I'd like to, you, you mentioned the Council of line, Nine as well, and um, I'm curious if this can even be defined. When we're referring to angels and archang archangels, are they, are they in a particular dimension? Are they 13th dimension, 12th dimension, 9th? Is there a particular place or are they all over the place? It truly depends upon the being that is named as such. And, and we'll take angels, for example, because 
uh, often human beings are putting angels in the same category. Um, they are somewhat those who have passed on from their, their own family lineage, for example, or who have come to usher them through their own soul's divine plan. Angels, we believe, are often those who exist in a dimension above and beyond the one that the race they are supporting has entered. Meaning angels can exist in multiple dimensions, but for the most part are focused upon the same experiences that those they come to serve are also uh, involved in. This can lower the dimension of their highest possibility, and that's actually perfect for their assignment and scenario, because in order for them to be tangibly accessible uh, to those they serve, or sometimes to even come to a planet like Earth and exist in a physical form where they walk as an angelic being, uh, they are lowering a part of their vibration or, or, or accessing some level of density in order to do that. Archangels are a bit different and, and, and similar in terms of their assignment, but are more multidimensional in, in, in a simultaneous way or a coherent way. Um, for example, if you are tuning into an archangel like Michael, uh, Michael can be in many places at once, uh, speaking to many beings at once, uh, healing many beings at once, because Michael is not a singular entity. Michael is accessing all aspects of himself throughout space and time simultaneously, which means he may be moving through multiple dimensions at, at, at times when it's necessary uh, to fragment himself into many different scenarios. So we might say the difference is an, an, an angelic being can be somewhat more linear <laughs> in terms of the dimension they're choosing in order to support the souls that they are assigned to, uh, where archangels are assisting more on a collective level and moving through uh, a multidimensional expression in order to accomplish this. So someone like Metatron, for example, would be in multiple dimensions simultaneously. We couldn't really say that he's 12th dimensional or 13th in particular. Uh, we could say this, and, and in order to actually um, fully express as an archangel into many dimensions, you would have ascended through the highest dimension possible in the universe in which you are stationed. So, so um, uh, let's define humans and how this works with humans first, and then we'll talk about archangels because there is a bit of a difference. And, and it's a complicated topic, we think, to take on in such a short period of time. But imagine that right now, uh, humans on planet Earth are moving into a fifth dimensional reality. And fifth dimension is actually a gateway to accessing multidimensional energies. It does not mean it's a guarantee that you're able to express yourself the same way as an archangel does. But in a linear, physical, and material plane, multidimension expresses as more options. So instead of you becoming the one that is scattering itself everywhere, what you begin to realize is that the material reality is scattering more of itself in availability to you. So, so multi-dimension is somewhat defined differently and, and manifests differently uh, depending upon the planet that you've chosen, the form that you've chosen, and the experience you're having. But an archangel has typically reached a point in its evolutionary passage as a soul where it has moved through all 12 dimensions in succession. Because in order to truly fragment itself in this way, it must have somehow become a part of every dimension in a, in a logical uh, form. And that isn't always physical necessarily, uh, but certainly that form is utilized in order to serve those that need it. So, so archangels are having more of a, uh, we'll say conscious and sentient um, experience and understanding of multidimensionality than what you would on planet earth at this point in your evolution. 
So is it fair to say then that somebody like Metatron would be in, uh, if we were to speak with the Council of Nine, that he would be a member of that, but he would also be a member of the Council of Light and the 12th dimension as well? It is true that this is correct at the same time. Know that anytime a council is forming, it is not one thing. So, so through the linear construct of mind, you are attempting to rectify what a council is and how it remains. And, and certainly in ancient civilizations like Atlantis, for example, physical councils were present and stagnant and consistent and led entire civilizations. But when councils form in order to provide guidance, such as in a channel transmission like the one you are receiving, there's fluidity. Because if we are accessing the ninth dimension, what we're going to do is we're going to call in every being and every Akashic um, avenue possible in order to provide information that is suitable to the one requesting. And we know that you're requesting for a great many others. So certainly Metatron uh, in that, um, we'll say, uh, multidimensional expression of him must exist in that collective because he has been there uh, for such a long period of time. But it doesn't always mean that the, the essence, or the soul essence, in other words, of Metatron uh, is taking the forefront. So, so in a collective, there is intentional agreement and that agreement is a coherent and heart-based resonance. So it is somewhat a sharing environment where everyone is contributing something to the whole and the whole is expressed through oneness. I'd like to speak with Metatron then as well, uh, in addition to the other council that's available today. Okay, am I speaking with Metatron then? Okay. In, uh, in the book of Enoch, um, the, the book, or the various books of Enoch, reference that Enoch ascended to heaven or to, was taken away by God and that um, at that moment became Metatron. Is this true? This is a multidimensional interpretation of an astral projected experience in which there was an initiation that had taken place. So, so the becoming of any one thing in, in, in a linear sense is, is not really the goal of, of God expressing itself through any soul. You are here to become a, a blended and combined manifestation of, of all that you have ever been before. But, but sometimes there are very specific lineages that are meant to be activated to bring them closer to earth. So in the story that you are telling, uh, this in fact was the case. Um, Enoch, as a soul in the lineage of, of Metatron and many others, uh, decided to extend itself beyond the earth and the physical manifestation that he had chosen to become reintegrated, in other words, or reborn in a spiritual sense to carry out the um, assignment, we might say, or the teachings of an archangel like Metatron. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, Metatron or an aspect of the consciousness of what is Metatron experienced a human physical life as Enoch or at least some sort of a life on earth. Is that correct? We could say that this is true. Yes. And is, is the book of Enoch or the books of Enoch, are they relatively accurate to that life experience or was some of it um, made up? Well, when you say accurate, you're interpreting a, a symbolic expression of a soul's life and process of soul ascension that has not necessarily been told in a way that is meant to be understood through the mind. And this is often the problem that we see happening with the translation of, of ancient codes and tablets and documents like this. Um, these stories are not truly meant to be taken literally. They contain within them uh, key code activations and, and vibrational translations of the processes that are still available to you today. So, so there is some... Um, 
involvement of um, fantasy, we might say, or lore that has taken these stories a bit out of context. Uh, at the same time, we actually see them as being accurate uh, in terms of what they were uh, designed to do. Okay, so some of the storyline may be mythology, not necessarily accurate. So maybe you can help me to differentiate between when we're dealing with mythology and when we're dealing with some deeper meaning that may be multidimensional in nature. Uh, it said that Enoch was the uh, grandfather of Noah as well. Is that true? This is true. Okay. And, and so that would mean if we're placing it in a linear timeline based on what we know about biblical stories and such that, that Enoch must have lived um, just around the time of the flood or the cataclysm that occurred at the end of Atlantis. This is correct. Okay. So did Enoch live on Earth uh, in the previous dimension when Atlantis was existing or was he after that in our current linear timeline? Well, it is somewhat both because we have to rectify that the timeline prior to the flood existed as a different dimension than the one after. And many of the souls who came from Atlantis actually went through a very um, intense transition in, in order to find themselves in a form in a different location geographically and, and physically. Uh, so we can place him in Atlantis and even predating Atlantis going into Sirius because that entire lineage is a very important one that we have noted in past transmissions. So Enoch was Syrian then? Yes. Did he have a humanoid form or was he more of a different kind of form? We, um, it's difficult for us to explain humanoid in terms of that timeline because everyone may have seemed to have a more human presentation while at the same time taking on varying degrees of their human hybrid lineage. Um, so if we go back to Atlantis, for example, we may be looking at beings who seem less human, but nonetheless took on many of the characteristics of, of what you may know today as human. It was just their energy fields were operating quite differently. Um, and this is why you see them depicted as such energetic beings of light, for example. Uh, they were working uh, more in concert with not only uh, their light, uh, their light bodies, but the uh, auric field of earth and had knowledge as to how to work with uh, what we refer to as a divine technology that is supporting a human soul's ability to integrate its cosmic nature. So, so certainly we see more of a human-like presentation in Enoch while at the same time, a more uh, metaphysical and cosmic ability to shape shift and to time travel and to, as an oracle, be able to retrieve certain messages and, and information from the universe at large. Now, could we define something similar when it comes to Metatron or when you reach the stage of an archangel, you are sort of beyond a lineage? Was he, for example, Syrian or is or at this stage would we not even be able to give that any sort of a definition it, it's difficult to place a lineage on an archangel other than to say there would have been a timeline of deep study so when we're looking at archangels and and lineages and initiations what we're often observing is uh, a group of souls that decided to study together in, in a universal school of some fashion, whether that be existent on the planet, in the inner earth, or off planet, and focused on one very specific area of knowledge. So uh, a soul, an archangel like Metatron, would have taken many forms throughout the universe as a part of that study and teaching. But we also see Metatron as one of the original sparks of creation. So, so even though um, we might say that your lineage as a human being also contains that original spark of creation, uh, there are some so closely connected to the origins of this universe 
that they hold a great deal of light information and knowledge, even power to heal. So we place Metatron in that area or, or range, we'll say, um, of, of elder beings in this universe manifesting straight from God and understanding itself as a non-physical being wanting to create many experiences throughout the universe in order to teach what it is to create something like the self or to know the self as a creator. Now, so there are some questions I have about the story of Enoch, which may or may not be actual physical occurrences. But uh, for example, Enoch is said to have been visited by um, the fallen angels, for example, which were uh, described in detail in, in the books. And uh, that these fallen angels came to earth. Of course, a lot of the stories we've already discussed in previous conversations, but essentially they impregnated the, the human women of the earth or the women of the earth at the time and produced the Nephilim. And uh, so is that is that true? Was that an experience that Enoch actually had? Or um, was it just a... And many others in this time. So, so you must remember that this experience was not exclusive to Enoch. It was simply a period in time when those that were present on the earth would have been involved in such an experience. Okay. Now, one thing that I'm having a little trouble understanding is the, the, the God that's referred to in the book of Enoch or the books of Enoch appears to be a very angry, vengeful type of God, a God who... Uh, for example, the God who wanted to punish people for their sins, or uh, apparently the God who created the flood and orchestrated the flood in order to wipe out the Nephilim and in the process also a lot of humans as well. And, uh, and so the story of Noah also folds into that. In previous conversations, we talked about how the one true God is the God that's within uh, and not an actual separate entity outside of us. But the, the books of um, uh, Enoch seem to be describing a God that's outside of us that's a judgmental God. So can you give, shed some light on that? In, in our interpretation, to, to give everyone who is listening um, an explanation of, of what this truly refers to, uh, the simplest term would be ego. Uh, there is an, an aspect of self that is always viewing another. Uh, the environment that is influencing us is causing us to have an opinion of it. And, and in so doing, we are the ones who are self-destructing or creating an environment that is capable of self-destruction. So we think the interpretation of this passage or or part of the uh, translation has more to do with the inner than you believe it actually does. Uh, this vengeful God could have never come about unless there was something to be vengeful of, and that could only exist beyond ourselves. Yet there was a period prior to the flood in which the um, infiltration of peaceful civilizations like Atlantis uh, brought teachings of judgment and comparison and, and using technologies in order to create more hierarchical types of structures where a slight few had access to energy and others did not. And we think this is a continuation, perhaps, of this experience and even a warning, perhaps, of, of how the ego can be this destructive on a physical planet. Okay, so the book's a little hard to understand that in that context then because it's it seems like a good deal of the book is about Enoch's interactions with the fallen angels and this God that he is speaking with. And, um, and in the end, Enoch, apparently according to the book, it, he was taken away by this God and transformed into Metatron. So how does that, can you explain what that means? Well, there is no vengeful God, but in the translation of the book of Enoch, if you are interpreting the ego self as that God, what you are actually observing is the self-destruction of a soul. But in the 
um, entry of Metatron. It is the possibility to imbue the self with a higher identity. Um, in other words, we would have to explain how you're structured and, and how you've been taken away from that divine structure because ultimately you believe you are here with an identity and you've been taught uh, that God is prime creator and able to supply everything that you need. And so you are praying to that God in order to receive things. But ultimately, this was not the original blueprint or, or, or prophecy of the cedars who came to create a new race. You have within you uh, the technology, uh, the possibility of accessing all parts of you simultaneously throughout the universe, no less powerfully than an archangel. But unfortunately, what happens is that you become suppressed into the ego. And as you do, you begin to filter that ego through the construct of separation. You are viewing the world through a limited perspective. And this limited perspective is creating a belief of that limitation in a very profound way. So we might say the, the fallen angels, the, one who came, the ones who came to destroy the earth in this story, um, are, are no less prominent than the ones you believe are destroying the earth today. But in your judgment of it, in, in your perspective that you are powerless in this situation, you are not allowing the parts of you that understand how to rise above it to actually be fused. So each of you has the opportunity when you embrace the ego internally and turn it in the direction of the, the highest self to initiate with a part of you beyond the veil that is able to come in and teach and lead and support the earth in becoming the, the highest manifestation of consciousness. So the story is symbolic in nature and was always meant to be. It is just that it has been literally interpreted in order to assume tragedy and, and that a God would be vengeful. When in fact, what the story of Enoch is proving to us is that how we see the world has everything to do with how the world becomes accessible through our own soul. Okay, so let me just sort of put string some ideas together and let me know if it makes any sense. So what you're saying is that the vengeful God in the story is the ego, and that the transformation of Enoch into Metatron is the transcendence of the ego, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, and help me rectify the story of Noah. Now, in previous conversations, we've talked about how um, in Atlantis there was a portal that was opened, and through this portal came various Anunnaki beings who ultimately triggered the, um, the destruction or the cataclysm that destroyed Atlantis and caused a dimensional shift about 13,000 years ago, which um, started the timeline we're living in now. Now, so if all of that is true, how does the story of no now in the story of Noah there appears to be a god who told Noah to, to um, do certain things to um, survive the flood. And meanwhile, that god wiped out the rest of the human race or rest of life on earth for the most part. And, um, and we can see some evidence of this, of course. There are lots of sites around the world um, where we can see underground inhabitations and so on where people seem to have... Um, lived for quite a number of years, probably during an apocalyptic period. So there's some evidence of that as well. So, so if um, what exactly happened in the Noah story then? If because he's also he seems to be dealing with a vengeful God who did this and decided to save him, as he was the grandson of Enoch. Well, you must first remember that these biblical translations have somewhat been hijacked, and and they have been turned on you in order to lower your frequency. Uh, when we're looking at the story of Noah and, and a message from God, uh, first consider that God would never destroy anything that has ever been created, even if that creation in and of itself could destroy another, because it is the only opportunity 
for souls that exist in the present moment to uh, actually manifest the, um, the opposite of it. Everything that we are creating has a foundation within the Akashic Records. And, and that is for great purpose because this is an evolutionary universe. And in order to evolve, there must be something to evolve from. So for a vengeful God to attempt to do something to destroy the planet would put into motion a series of events, taking it out of the natural rhythm of everything that had ever happened before. But if we do consider that there was a cataclysm in Atlantis, we must also know that that cataclysm or the vibration of it is apt to come back around, especially if those on the planet past that period of time are somehow repeating the same patterns. And, and ultimately, this is what we see have, having had taken place. Uh, again, no different to where humanity stands today. Uh, within the spiral of time, you have come to a crescendo point where so much of your history, uh, that which you have would prefer to have not had take place, is apt to be placed in your fingertips for you to become the alchemizers of it. So we might think of Noah as having been placed in the position to share a message, not about impending disaster, but how to actually overcome it. Now, the story of the ark and the animals that is so linearly translated is such an intergalactic timeline that many would not believe. But ultimately keep in mind that at this period of time, the intergalactic races from beyond the earth were in regular contact with those on the planet. Uh, ships were not an unusual sight. Um, there were many occasions for intergalactic souls to come and walk hand in hand with those that existed on the physical planet. And these were both malevolent and benevolent beings. But teaching of the universe's Akashic records and understanding how to manifest them in, in perfect precision to what a collective desired uh, there were teachers, light teachers and, and others, who were guiding those like Noah. They were supporting their understanding of how to create technologies, for example. And some of them were asked to co-create and work together in order to maintain certain genetic prototypes and ensure that they could continue on and thrive in case uh, the worst had happened. So the ark itself is more a technology than a ship. Uh, the beings that were on it in, in masculine and feminine balance are a representation of the capture of the DNA of those races that needed to be um, uh, upheld and somehow um, restored and brought back in perfect symmetry. And now certainly there were some that went on ships at this time and were taken off planet and waited to um, ensure a more safe environment to return while others were directed beneath the earth. It, Noah was not the only pivotal leader or mentor in terms of this period of time. Uh, there were also many others, but, but the story itself captures the essence of co-creation between many cosmic beings throughout the globe and humans that existed on earth at the time. So who was the, the voice of the God in the story of Noah? Was that another ego representation or in previous conversations, we discussed how the Anunnaki triggered or in some way caused the, the cataclysm to occur when they came through the portal in Atlantis. So is it maybe an Anunnaki voice that we're hearing in the Noah story or somebody else? Well, we can't necessarily say it is an Anunnaki voice exclusively, but, but certainly at this time, many were being led astray by those with malevolent intent, uh, very similar to and of Anunnaki descent. Uh, yet the translation of Noah's story coming through a more biblical vehicle is something, again, that was very symbolic that has been taken out of context. 
the very idea of God being angry or vengeful is a, um, we'll say, suppressive mechanism uh, purposely placed in the story in order to keep humans in a certain lowered vibration. Because remember, the um, satanic rituals that we have described of, of, of the past that still carry out today, um, Satan is an assembly of many dark entities and beings uh, focused on the same intention, even coming to earth perhaps for a specific co-creative endeavor. And we might say the gods of the time were looked at in this way, some of them being more malevolent and others being more benevolent. Well, if we're to consider the story of Noah took place pretty close to the story of Enoch, since it was his grandfather, then, uh, and that was in the pre-flood time anyway, we would have still had the fallen angels, I would imagine, uh, interacting somehow. And so would we say at least some of what we refer to as Satan or Satanism is the fallen angels that were there, right? They were part of that group. Yes, this is correct. And and we also want to add that uh, where Atlantis was more of a technologically advanced society, um, heart-based certainly, and focused on spiritual evolution, we look at the period of Enoch and Noah not as being such focused on uh, technological advancement, even though uh, ship technology, for example, was very rampant and present at this time. Uh, more so focused upon the evolution of of a soul, Uh, the understanding of who a soul was in order to relate to God as a being or an entity, making that direct connection from an auricular standpoint. Um, These prayers that are spoken today, um, as we have mentioned, they diminish a soul when uh, power is being placed within the hands of another So if the focus was to somehow um, elevate the power of a soul in connection to God, uh, what we're seeing the dichotomy of here is the good and evil, those that were here on the planet to take that story away or somehow skew it or create distortions in the way of a relationship to self, while others were actually supporting the Ascension timeline. Okay, I'm going to string a few ideas together. Let me know if I'm on the right track. So from previous conversations, as I just mentioned a moment ago, we know that um, due to some portal technology in Atlantis, the Anunnaki came through. And then we move over to Enoch, who was maybe shortly after that time period or right around the time of this cataclysm. And uh, at the same time as that, as Enoch's story, the fallen angels came to earth. So what I'm wondering is, in the Atlantean timeline story of the Anunnaki coming through the portal, causing all his destruction, it seems like the Enoch story overlaps a little bit with that, with the fallen angels coming to earth and causing all his destruction. So were the Anunnaki the same as the fallen angels or in just two different storylines or um uh, or or are they just the fallen angels happened to come through because the portal had already been opened in the time of atlantis well well certainly we can say that the fallen angels include the anunnaki even the same bloodline and lineage that you would have found entering atlantis through the portal that we have spoken of But yes, once a portal is open anywhere in the universe, uh, it tends to remain somewhat active, even if for a period of time it closes, meaning there is passage by certain beings who have a direct energetic connection to it. And this is ultimately what happened. So the fallen angels in the time of Enoch, uh, while they were certainly more dominant in their um, uh, Anunnaki presentation, Uh, included many others as well. Uh, We cannot exclude, for example, uh, greys or reptilians because dismantled Anunnaki portals, um, ultimately, that that still exist today, uh, carry within them a, a certain technology that matches certain periods of time. So, so remember the spiral of time we talked about. There's, there's a repeat going on here 
of various events. And the only way that that can happen is when frequencies align. So if we have the right recipe vibrationally happening within any container within the universe, whether it be a timeline of, of Earth or a, a timeline elsewhere, um, we are going to see the timing and the accessibility of portals change right along with it. Because ultimately, many on planet Earth did not realize that this was possible. Um, no one was supporting those that were there currently in the period of Noah and Enoch to understand the technology at that intrinsic um, um, a perspective, in other words. So that's why we're comparing uh, and contrasting the two, saying that Atlantis was more of a highly technological and advanced civilization, uh, where in the period of Enoch and Noah, um, it was more of a grounded, um, perhaps soul evolutionary process as opposed to focused on technology. And this is why we see these, these similar streams of energy and uh, entry of malevolent beings. Okay, so just to make sure I understand, so portal was open in Atlantis, some Anunnaki came through, the portal remained open, and the fallen angels came through, of which there were some Anunnaki and reptilian and greys and so on. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and that portal still remains open today? It does, but it's slightly different in its orientation. So we've noticed the fluctuation in Earth portals taking place for a very long time. Um, right now, what we can say is that there is a great deal of instability uh, in the earth portals. There are times when human consciousness has raised to such a threshold where the technologies and the keys within those portals automatically close, meaning there isn't a matching vibration enough for Anunnaki, for example, or, or others to actually enter. You must also consider there have been a great many changes in your grid system. And portals are anchored to specific locations within a planet's grids. And because of that change, um, there are also periods of time where these portals become very unstable. And we do see the influx or the entry of many dark entities and beings. But um, because there are so many diligently working, uh, both on these portals as well as these grid points and locations, uh, that is also rapidly changing. It's, it's somewhat like... Uh, firemen putting out a fire. Uh, when there's a forest fire that is very massive in scope, uh, we're not sure exactly where to focus. But, but if we focus on one area for a long enough period of time, uh, we will begin to put out the fire. And, and that's what's happening on a, on a grander scale. Uh, there are a lot of forest fires going on in, in earthly portals and Anunnaki portals and the like. Um, grid workers are putting out the flame and sometimes the flame is catching from other portals and other um, experiences, frequency matches, in other words. Uh, and this will continue to go on, we think, for, for quite a while before things tend to level out. Now, is the portal that was opened by the CERN Large Hadron Collider, which we discussed last time, is that a different type of portal? It is. And... In, 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 we would have a difficult time describing this in a technological fashion because it doesn't work exactly like some of the portals that have been here since ancient times. Um, it's more a molecular type of consciousness and structure, believe it or not, that's focused in um, the energetic match of multiple souls to those throughout the universe. Uh, this portal is... Um, it, it is somewhat malevolently focused and intended, yet at the same time, we see its um, primary um, uh, provision uh, being research. So, so from a genetic standpoint, there's a lot of activity and observation going on through this portal. And, and that isn't just the entry of beings necessarily, um, it's the skewing of your genetic template because any time that we have an electromagnetic interface with um, a molecular being or a being that is existing uh, within its own light, um, the earth itself can become an entire magnet to that energy. 
meaning we accelerate whatever the portal is attempting to do. So, so certainly it's a, it's a bigger discussion than this, but, but yes, um, we do have great concerns about what you are asking us uh, about here. <laughs> uh, and we have um, made some diligent observations of its potential. Okay, getting back to the story of Noah and Enoch, and uh, now as we established already, Enoch and Noah did have a physical incarnation. Noah was the grandson of Enoch, and Noah, through the technology you described earlier, uh, which was not literal to the story of the ark, uh, it, as it is in the Bible, um, and the God that is represented in that story of Noah, who advised him to do these things to, to save himself and the genetic code of other living beings. Are we saying that that God wasn't an actual being or could it have been one of the fallen angels or Anunnaki or a, a conglomeration of them? Well, let's make it quite clear. We don't see Noah as being ill-advised. So the God he is referring to might even be considered um, the, the, the God Ra, for example. Um, one that is speaking on behalf of many throughout the universe and teaching and supporting uh, a soul on earth to lead a great many others. So when we are talking about God in the Bible, there is sometimes um, a, a slight distinction that has to be made depending upon the story and the biblical figure or prophet, because all of these deviations that have taken place from the truth of the symbology are causing humans to believe that the interaction was solely with God itself, when, when sometimes, in fact, other gods were present, uh, supporting the uh, foundation of society and the collective of humans that were there at that period. So you're, are you saying that Ra was the God that he was talking to and that he was not ill-advised, meaning that uh, the dark portion of the story where it made him appear to be a vengeful God was probably made up? What, what we want to take out of the story that is so prominent is fear, even though it does seem a very fearful event. Because while Noah was set out to carry out many tasks and to um, engage others in the prophecy of what may occur, he was doing so from a state of crystalline presence, meaning in speaking to a God like Ra and many others, he was informed about the workings of the universe and taught how to anticipate the manifestation potentials that a collective could have been creating. So, so there are many subtle nuances here that we don't believe are completely captured in the biblical stories that are being told today, uh, nor uh, the, the, the very limited translations of them. Uh, certainly Noah as a guide and an intergalactic being himself, more presenting in a human form, had um, uh, incredible capabilities from an, an energetic and, and sensory standpoint. So to have a prophet or a biblical figure speaking to God or a God is an indication that they may have been revered by a certain number of human souls because of their abilities and, and purpose uh, in that period. And that is something that still continues on today. Um, many of you are uh, oracles and, and prophets yourselves interacting with representatives of God in different forms that are supporting the movement into a higher dimension. In the story of Enoch, the, uh, Enoch talks about how the Nephilim were created. And these fallen angels taught the Nephilim about various metaphysical principles and magical practices and things like that. But in previous conversations, we talked about how a lot of these teachings came from Atlantis prior to the flood. And when the dimensional shift occurred, a lot of those fragmented into secret societies and so on. Um, and 
and supposedly also the fallen angels were referred to as a watchers and and these individuals taught the nephilim um various practices which ultimately the nephilim ended up um being um not only eating other humans but themselves according to the story anyway so is the practice that still exists today of using these very lower vibrational kabbalistic teachings such as uh, magical teachings and so on did that originate from the fallen angels teaching this or is it just that the teachings got corrupted because of the dimensional shift that happened at the at the great flood well it's actually a bit of both because when we're looking at the fallen angels we we must keep in mind that their origins exist beyond this earth so to have brought certain practices like this to the earth and and even to have um defined them in in such a malevolent fashion is showing us uh, a certain history, um, a, a lineage that has followed them throughout time. Uh, but also keep in mind the, the more suppressive intention of these beings was based in power. And that power was not physical alone. It was an energetic type of power that where they were attempting to assimilate from a great many human beings on earth. Now, from a symbolic standpoint, um, when we are uh, using the, the blood of another human or the body of another human for our sustenance, uh, there is no brotherhood, there is no unity. It is the greatest act of division that we could possibly inflict upon our own race. So, so this goes without saying that these teachings, or, or as you have put them, Kabbalistic practices, uh, continue on today because they are in reference of a Satanistic type of presence that still lives on and is attempting to bring humans into a chronic and constant state of division and, and separation. This ultimately weakens you. But it is not only the, the physical part of it that is so important. Um, the energy that exists within the blood, within the bones, within the cells, uh, within the body, its, its prevalence goes well beyond earth. So you are made of light, you are made of information. And any god or collective that is attempting to use that information for itself only uh, is sliding the rest of the collective. It's a hierarchical type of determination that is being made here that is carrying out a, a bloodline's certain dominance, in other words. So, so we could see this um, showing up in many different ways and in, in ritualistic practices as well as physical ones that still continue on today. Okay, so depending, uh, I'd like to delve into that a, a bit more. So you're talking about human blood having a certain kind of life force or multidimensional potential. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What is significant about human blood? Well, if we go back to the beginning of time, to the origins of humanity, the very first human beings that were ever manifested were not birthed from physical contact, contact or sexual activity. Uh, there, were, there were ceremonies that were carried out, uh, tantric and otherwise, uh, connecting the breath of a great many souls in the highest intention of love. And through this, many immaculate conceptions took place. So, so the very first hybrid humans that stepped onto this earth as physical beings did so through the breath of a great many others. And this is your lineage. So, so everything that has come into form that now exists in a material fashion is carrying the light of consciousness. It's carrying the intention of those that combined their breath in the highest love and reverence for the expansion of the universe. So if you take that and you extrapolate it into each unique being, what we see is God expressing in a unique form, carrying all of that energy, information, and history from the very beginning of time. 
but you have been taught that this is a physical elixir only, the blood or the bone or, or the heart. Uh, these are simply organs and, and part of your internal structure that keep you alive. When in fact, if the light of consciousness exists in these things and there is life force energy that is moving them throughout the body, we know we are looking at one of the most precious and valuable resources in a human soul. And that's ultimately why many of these beings that have lost their way in their own star systems, whether it be genetically or through similar cataclysms to what you have faced on earth, uh, would come and attempt to gain something from the physical body or from the physical soul. It's, it's a transference of energy and power that you may not understand or, or have diminished, but that they take great pride and value in. Even your DNA, for example, the, the codes within your DNA are multi-galactic. The Akashic records of all 12 and now to 13 dimensions exists within each DNA strand. You are not just programmed to the lineage of your family. You are programmed to your cosmic lineage and do all things that have ever been created on any planet, star system, or in any race. And to have that energy and information available at the prick of a finger or within a drop of saliva or blood tells you the importance um, or, or pricelessness, we'll say, um, of its possession. So, so this is an act of possession, in other words, uh, where many of you would interpret that word to only mean possession of energy. Um, certainly your energy precludes you. It, it exists in all parts of your physical body. Okay, I, I found that there's a prevalence of the idea of the color red, for example, throughout our history. Uh, and for example, the Phoenicians, the word has red in its meaning. Or if we look at uh, the Rosicrucians, which is a rosy cross, or the Rothschilds, which is red shield, and we have the American Red Cross today. So there seems to be this prevalence of a red cross or the red theme. Uh, and of course, the Red Cross deals with blood donations. So, uh, so are you saying that by the consumption of human blood, that which is probably still practiced by a lot of secret societies and world leaders today, that they are gaining some sort of control or life force energy, which allows them to do the things they do. Yes, we, we agree with that, especially the determination you are making about the importance of the word red. Uh, but the the bloodletting or consumption, it it truly is a, a symbolic ritual that goes beyond the energy that is so potent within you. Because the blood is showing us how humanity has become perhaps its own race other than many that it, it had seeded it. Um, for example, those that came at the very beginning of time from multiple races, uh, none of them have the same color blood that you do. Uh, many of them are operating more um, in their life and light force. And because of this, uh, combining their energy as one and operating with different elixirs that manifest in a range and variety of colors. But the red blood is a human characteristic and trait that came about through the hybridization of your race. And so to, to use that as a tool of manipulation is to take away the very thing that makes you powerful and unique. It, it, when we think of the um, families, for example, that you have brought to our attention, we are looking at lineages of races that date back to these Anunnaki and reptilian cosmic beings. And so what they're attempting to do in ingesting human blood is sometimes taking on more human characteristics that allow them to maintain an earthly presentation while also accessing energy from beyond the earth. Also, it is a mechanism of control. 
because the more they understand about the way you resonate and the way that you think, the more they are able to put into place mechanisms that continue to suppress you. Many today are uh, extremely concerned about the presence of artificial intelligence, uh, picking up on the, the wave or the framework of the collective human mind and being able to interpret and control it. This is done through your own DNA. So, so those who are very adept at understanding these rituals and ceremonies know that there's a telepathic presence and quality to them. Um, as they ingest that blood, they're able to think more like a human soul would think and understand how to manipulate that thinking, in other words, to become something other than what it should be. In previous conversations, we've talked about the iconography of national flags. Uh, for example, the use of Garuda in the U.S. flag or the U.S. seal or the use of um, Naga or um, the snake uh, type of being or the, um, uh, the lion being to indicate more Syrian lineage which we've seen in the uh, Indian seals as well as Tibet, for example. Um, but for Switzerland has a red cross. Now, what's the significance there? Is there any connection to this, what we're discussing right now about the blood? From, from ancient times, if we go back to the origins of this cross, we are looking at a secret society, one that practiced very much the same rituals that we are speaking of today. And, and so... Could we make um, a determination then that, that Switzerland's founding was based or organized by a group of people who are part of the secret society? Yes, certainly that geographic region is one that we see very prominently um, populated by these beings. So what's the significance of the American Red Cross collecting blood? Is it purely for altruistic purposes to help people or is there is there some connection to these secret societies that may be using it for that purpose? Uh, there are dualistic purposes here. As with many things on planet Earth, it is attempted to be perceived that this is a helpful society and in many respects it is providing something of need to the um, hospitals and uh, healing centers and humans that need it. But the draw of blood from a human body in and of itself is very ritualistic in nature. So even though some of the good is shown to humans, what much of the process does is influence many of these ceremonies that we have spoken of. And there are um, collection models, we'll call them, uh, somewhat like the technologies and the portals and the research that we have been talking about. Even we could say very similar in um, scope and purpose to CERN, where we are trying to detect certain molecular structures in dominance and um, change them in, in variance and vibration. When blood is being drawn and it is being given to another, we assume it's purity. We assume that it has not been tampered with. But there are some, not all, um, agencies that are involved in very malevolent intent and focus that are using this blood to both understand better the makeup of the human vibrational and physical structure in order to seed this information to philanthropists and um, we'll say groups of humans who are focused to the detriment of society and also change the blood slightly uh, in genetic orientation prior to it being used in medical procedures. So, so definitely there is some degree of malevolent intent here uh, behind the guise of a small amount of good that is being done. So in general, would it be fair to say that the giving of your blood or the drawing of your blood is harmful, and not just energetically, but otherwise? Well, we, we agree that on a physical basis, what you are doing when you are drawing blood is you are bloodletting, which is an of itself, uh, which is an of itself, uh, not a healing 
technique, even though it has been seen this way uh, in many ancient civilizations. What you release from the body that is not meant to be shared is always going to weaken the body's ability to hold its vibration. So, so if our blood contains life force and if that life force is elemental in accessing our cosmic origins or somehow accessing information from beyond the veil, uh, we want to retain all of it that we possibly can in order to keep not only our bodies strong, but, but more so our consciousness aligned. Even at times we notice there is an intent of physical harm in, in drawing blood for what seems to be a good purpose. Because what many have not been told is that the body's ability to heal that wound, even though it takes place almost automatically, takes a great deal of life force, energy, and focus. So any weak link in the body that has already been determined ill or not, um, that needs the immune system's attention or needs somehow to be uh, healed uh, is put on the back burner while the entire blood system of the body is assumed to need restoration. That's ultimately what's going on. Anytime we draw a small bit of blood, there is a process, uh, a chain of events that we are activating and the body's restoration uh, protocol kicks in. And the more that we do this, the less we are going to have um, uh, the body's support in the long run. Um, it's, it's somewhat like the fable that many would be familiar with of crying wolf. Uh, there are only so many times that you can cry wolf before someone becomes smart enough to realize you are doing it. Well, the body is very intelligent. And so it is always trying to compensate for anything that has been lost. But if we keep pulling things out of it that should not be displaced, the body is going to go on high alert and start to self-protect. And we see this as being a chronic and constant problem on planet Earth today, not only for this reason, uh, but for many others. Okay, I'd like to go back to the story of Enoch. Uh, is Metatron still speaking? Available? Yes. So I'm going to read just a little sentence from the book of one of the books of Enoch. It says, Enoch walked with God and then he was no more because God took him away. And, uh, and supposedly in the story at this point, uh, Enoch became Metatron and Metatron was put into the role as a universal scribe, essentially to keep track of, um, uh, everything that was, all the choices that were made in this universe, in what was referred to as the Akashic field or the Akashic records. Is this, any of this true? It is true. Uh, it is a question of how deliberately it is being interpreted. And, and it's important that I share um, perhaps a parallel experience that, that many would be having today. Uh, you are all record keepers of your own right, but you are only attending to the records that are important to your soul's personal evolution and that of the planet. Those that you are in contract with, for example, or those that you have a purposeful connection with. Uh, as Metatron, I am a record keeper of how the Earth experience uh, interfaces with the universe, but also how the spiral of time comes back to ensure constant evolution of the human creative process. Now, I do this in many different directions. I'm a multidimensional being. When Enoch took the hand of God and was assumed to have disappeared, it is no less a profound soul transition than what many of you are making in this timeline, just happening in a completely different way. So some of you are activating, for example, Kundalini and having very intensified experiences where you may go for days, months, or even years uh, integrating that energy and becoming someone completely new. Your lives tend to be stripped away very quickly because the material manifestation of all that you knew before can no longer be held in the new vibration that you have accepted. You have not physically left the earth so much 
as you have now attuned to your soul in a way different than you have ever been on the earth before. And this is what happened to Enoch. Even though there was a period of time when his death was um, imminent, uh, he still came back and remained a scribe and a record keeper and one that would continue to communicate with God, known as Metatron because he was initiated in that aspect of his soul and brought it deliberately to the earth to walk with him in a physical body. Um, this story, even though it tells that he was no longer, um, it, it's, it's somewhat missing the mark in terms of who Enoch truly was, because in order to be remembered as someone this significant in a biblical sense or, or in a, a timeline uh, passage so important, uh, a part of him would have always had to remain. And this is true with all of you as well. Uh, even though you may go through a very accelerated spiritual um, passage, and you may assume that you have become someone completely new, embodied by a new soul aspect, even naming yourself something other than you have been before, a part of you always remains. And that thread of energy will continue on even after your death. So Enoch going through a transition that put him in the position of a record keeper or, or a universal scribe uh, doesn't also account for the fact that his soul continued on in that lifetime and even beyond the veil as an advisor of those in his lineage. And he still uh, connects with many today on planet Earth, those who are channels and, and healers and otherwise, uh, here to assist the great shift in consciousness. Now you, Metatron, are referred to as a scribe for the universe. And in our previous conversations, um, we, I spoke with Thoth, and Thoth was also described as a scribe or a, thrive for, a scribe for the Egyptian civilization. What's the, what does it mean when we hear this description of scribe? It is an etheric determination of how a soul is moving between multiple dimensions, observing the creative energies that exist there and anticipating how they will manifest. So a scribe is, is not necessarily capturing in real time uh, all the events that are happening in each moment. This is why when you are going back to read the, the writings, for example, or what has been left behind of these beings, it isn't necessarily um, a linear perspective nor an, an easy one to understand. Uh, some of it is presented in symbolic terms because it's a more um, wide range view and approach of how future, past, and present were all blending together into one. A scribe is appointed to this position in order to observe a certain set of criteria, things that are happening in the universe of great importance. For example, as Metatron, I am always interested in how the universe is accessing the past and able to share it in the present moment and how those who receive it are able to use it through the filter of consciousness in order to create something new. This has been my position of authority. I have also been very focused on what some may call technology, which I perceive as more an etheric type of translation of energy, uh, somewhat like a metaphysical modality that can be used in order to shift consciousness. Now, uh, others, for example, have taken on this determination of scribe uh, for other purposes, uh, whether it be to understand the self or, or self-knowing in relationship to God, or even sometimes um, for the understanding of how planets and stars interact and communicate. Uh, there are many, many different positions that we would say exist uh, throughout the galactic universe with this responsibility. Think of what I'm doing, however, as a scribe, not being a linear presentation of history, 
But in real time, a quantum application um, of my observation being sent into the records for others to access. So, so even though a, a, a scribe who has been determined as such uh, may leave behind a record of something, it doesn't necessarily mean that that record uh, only depicts the moment in time in which they were present. Uh, most of us are offering a living translation of what has occurred before and how it needs to be understood in the present moment. That is what a living translation is. It's, it's a quantum expression of something tempered to the consciousness of the souls that are yet to receive it. And this is why we would consider ourselves multidimensional uh, guides or, or sometimes even archangels. Because we are able to work with all of these dimensions, we're able to share the application of what we know in a way that most benefits the souls that are yet to receive it. So you're described as a uh, scribe for the universe. And is, does that mean that you're a scribe for just this universe or multiverse? I am focused on this universe, although I have visited many others and am very intimately aware of the connections between this universe and what is known as the multiverse. So does every universe have a different scribe? Certainly they do. And, and there is a reason for this, because every universe is completely different in how it operates, how it creates, and what the beings within it must understand. And so in this universe, as described for this universe, you are overseeing the Akashic records for, for this universe only. Overseeing is not a term that I would necessarily use for the position I have been appointed. Uh, there is no overseer, one or, or many of the Akashic records, for it is taken ownership by all. So, so the Akashic records are an, uh, a manifestation, we will call it a living manifestation of, of all that is being created in real time that everyone has access to. I am more an observer of patterns of these records, how they are being changed and how those changes may affect future generations or even past timelines because the Akashic records are quantum. If, I, if there is one thing that is of greatest importance that is a part of my role, uh, it is understanding how to consolidate this, this massive account of all that has happened uh, throughout space and time uh, into valuable packets of information and light that can be retrieved and utilized, um, put into some uh, reference frame of time uh, for those who need it. So basically, when a channel accesses the Akashic records, so you're saying your role is to package that information so that others can retrieve it. I certainly do that, but not in all instances. So not every channel who is accessing the Akashic records is going through Metatron as a gatekeeper to receive something. It's, it's a difficult process and, and massive in scope to understand. Uh, but what I always am doing is noticing the changes that are made to that information as it comes through a channel, because I know that if there's been a determination made of any energy or information in the Akashic records, it's apt to change something else. And this is where I am doing my record keeping or my best work. Uh, it is helping the whole of the universe to come into some form of symmetry. Um, let me draw a bridge here between uh, my role as an individual archangel in the universe and that of the Council of Light, because this council has worked with you on many occasions. And what they do is very similar to what I do, just in a different framework. Uh, the Council of Light is always observing what is being created throughout the universe and how those creations are being shared. There's a massive grid system that connects every planet and star. And that grid system, uh, it can be read through uh, the illumination of light, through sound, uh, through frequency. And those that exist at the t level of the 12th dimension are very adept um, at, at reading this massive matrix. 
uh, no less simply as you are able to pick up a book uh, and read the chapters. Their role is to determine where there can be influence or diversion of a, a planet's natural evolutionary path from that of another. So for example, the Earth as a whole, humanity as a whole, has a natural evolutionary path, very much like your individual soul's divine plan. And while there is a great uh, deal of room and space uh, for co-creation, uh, if there is a race, a star system, that takes that plan off track, the Council of Light is apt to put some filtration system in the grids, clear out any distortions, for example, or um, raise up the vibration of a more positive timeline energy that would neutralize the negative. What I do is quite similar, except my observation is of the spiral of time and how the Akashic records are folding into this spiral and where the energy may play out. So if a channel is interpreting the Akashic records for someone and they are filtering it through the ego, and they offer a message that is limiting in scope or, or worth or choice. What I see is a pattern evolving where that will influence something else in their life and every other life that they touch. So my role is to somehow neutralize that, to counteract it, to help humanity receive the most accurate and crystal clear translations of the Akashic records without any filter or distortion, such that they're able to use it in a positive way to uplift their soul's plan as opposed to reduce its prominency uh, uh, on planet Earth. So is it fair to say then, based on our earlier conversation, that the because you are the scribe for this universe, that the Akashic records that you maintain are contained within 13 dimensions? That is, that is correct. That is a correct determination, yes. In the late, I believe, 1100s to early 1200s, um, someone by the name of Leonardo Pisano, who we also know as Fibonacci, um, came up with the Fibonacci sequence. And he also came up with what he termed Metatron's cube. Now, he attributed it to you, is what's the connection there that this would have been named after you was this something that you channeled through him correct now the fibonacci scale uh, and the one who designed it on earth was not only channeling it through me but was also a representative of the arcturian collective so this is somewhat a mathematical and scientific translation of the various symmetry and relationship between the earth and all of those that exist upon it, all living beings creating as one. But in the Metatron's cube, this is another, um, uh, we might say schematic or way to present this, uh, no less in its importance in terms of how humans can tap into that energy. But yes, certainly there was a relationship between myself and this man helping to sort out all of the various e equations and, and sounds and waves that support a soul's understanding of universal energy. Now, it's believed that, that the, or said anyway, that the Metatron's cube was created from your soul and that you use it to manage and oversee the universe. Is what, what does that mean exactly? While I would like to take ownership of, of something so wonderful, uh, it could never be the manifestation of my soul alone. It is simply a representation of how my soul sees all of the energy of the universe coalescing into one. So we, all of us who are here, have access to this cube that is showing our uh, oneness and our interconnection as universal beings. But in its translation, what the cube is offering is a part of my oversight of all things that the Akashic records have shown me. Uh, 
it is quite a massive um, definition to relay again in such a concise um, understanding because what I've noticed in, in the time that I have been a scribe for this universe, which is quite a lengthy period of position, uh, is that everything is creating everything else. Uh, each moment that you are in tune with your own unique soul essence and sound, you are amplifying something else that is causing it to become renewed. And in that renewal, the sound of the entire planet becomes upgraded. And the cube is my gift in terms of my vision in a very compact uh, light code or, or technology uh, that can set you into a, um, um, uh, a container, we'll call it, a space uh, where you can be fully coherent with that universal frequency. So think of the Metatron's trans cube as a part of yourself that has been uh, translated into a very compact symbol and design that is able to help you sustain a natural state of universal coherence and presence. Okay, I'd like to spend the rest of our conversation discussing the mechanics and function and use of the Metatron's cube. Uh, Metatron's cube has 13 circles in it, and those 13 circles are also contained in the Flower of Life image that we have on the wall here, and so the Metatron's cube is essentially contained there. So is it fair to draw the connection that uh, the, the 13 circles in the Metatron's cube are also a correlation to 13 dimensions? This is correct. And so Metatron's cube would really only apply in our universe. It would not apply in another universe that has more than 13 dimensions. It, it would not apply per se. However, keep in mind that just like souls on planet Earth are accessing the Akashic records of this universe, souls in other universes are tapping into the multiverse and, and using information from it to build their own symmetry and symbology that can be supportive just like the cube. We've discussed in previous conversations about how the flower of life is the 369, and that is an unbroken connection to the universe. And considering that the Metatron's cube is contained within the flower of life, and uh, so what is the connection there between the two, uh, and where does one apply to certain things where the other one applies to other uses? Well, well, they exist in symmetry and, and show a relationship between all that you are creating and all that you are to everything else. So, so the cube perhaps being the, the origins or the center point of that symmetry is representing the origins and the center point of the universe. Uh, all things somehow connected together through um, all dimensions that are present. Because even though you exist here uh, in a, a dominantly third to fourth dimensional reality, doesn't necessarily mean that everything that you are and everything that you're doing uh, does not influence every other dimension that exists in this universe. So, so you have to break your mind out of the understanding that you are here uh, on planet Earth only meant to have a human experience that is enclosed within itself. Uh, what you are here doing is on behalf of all other universal beings expanding that universe. So, so everything that you are and everything that you do and everything that you create in every moment is having an influence on everything else throughout the universe. So the flower of life expanding itself to infinity is, is the creative motion or flow or, or life force of that universe. It is always in symmetry regardless of the creations that are taking place, which again is, is hard for a soul to believe because there are so many things determined to have happened or still happening uh, both on your planet and, and throughout the universe that don't seem to be symmetrical at all. They seem to be taking us out of that symmetry. Uh, but remember, this is a coherent vibratory tool. What it's aiming to do is put you in the framework of oneness, such that 
not only are you available to everything that you need to create in that oneness and unity, but also um, that you are conscious of how you are creating it. So, so when we use these symbols, uh, especially uh, seeing them fused together like this um, in ancient civilizations, what we're attempting to do is, is create somewhat a flow. And, and that flow exists all around you right now. It is just that many are not tuned into it deliberately. Um, you've been trained out of the vibration of the quantum or the present moment, which is ultimately where the most valuable contribution of your soul truly exists. So if you are not conscious of the present moment and you have been trained out of it, you're creating still in the symmetry of all that is, but you may be lowering its entire vibration. So, so just the very reminder that you are a part of this energy uh, activates a, a piece of your heart, a piece of your soul to its cosmic orientation, to, to remember that you are the universe ultimately in motion. You are not within it, you are of it. And, and, and a piece, an elemental piece of all that is taking place within it. Now, the Metatron's cube and the Flower of Life is supposedly uh, contains or contains all the shapes in the universe. So, and even, for example, the human body, there are 13 joints in the human body. Uh, we see 13 appear in a lot of secret societies and world events. Uh, we have um, Jesus and his 12 disciples, Jesus becoming the 13th, uh, which I assume is the higher octave as we, in a manner of speaking that we discussed earlier in our conversation. So is it fair to say that, or how would we, I'm going to articulate something and you can explain how it uh, should be actually articulated, but essentially the Metatron's cube and maybe the flower of life as well is showing sort of a universal pattern through which all things manifest into this universe then, which is why we see, for example, flower petals also follow the same pattern as that's established in Metatron's cube or the flower of life, for example, or the human body and so on. The creative force of the universe moves in a pattern that manifests through all things. So everything in this universe is represented within this pattern. And what you are noticing when you see it in the body, for example, or in a flower, is that unbroken connection to the universe that you hold to every one of these things. It is just that when this connection is not cherished or, or somehow consciously attuned to there is a, a falling out of symmetry in your own personal life. And, and perhaps we could say, this is why many suffer today. It's not that their creative power has waned. It's, it's not that the earth has taken a turn that has lowered their sovereignty. It's that they have forgotten the power of the flow of universal energy that they exist within that is ultimately meant to manifest in and upon itself more good every single day. It's, it's the symmetry and the beauty and the perfection that you are always attempting to look for, not the things that are ultimately wrong. And that's where you have been trained also, is to look beyond the symmetry, the beauty and the synchronicity, because that's where your intuition is, is uh, aligned. Uh, souls that have existed on planet Earth in this timeline uh, we might say genetically and from a historic standpoint, have been taken so far away from their metaphysical and prominent ability to tune in to what the universe is calling for from them, that they've lost their purpose, they have lost their way. So, so this natural predisposition of the universe to, to flow in an expanded pattern to infinity is representing your own infinite potential uh, to create what it is you desire within the framework and confines of what your soul has predetermined is necessary to become what you were always meant to be. Now, the 13 doesn't seem to only apply in physical things. Uh, for example, there are 13 full moons in an Earth year. So would we also apply that the same principles of Metatron's cube we would also see in patterns such as cycles as well? 
Well, planets are the origins of these cycles, because if we look at the beginning of the universe, we are looking at material um, uh, coming together and fusing within itself in this pattern of energetic flow. Uh, the life force that birthed each human from breath is through immaculate conception is, is the same process of the universe coming into formation simply through prana. And that material coalescing to become something that could be touched and felt and interacted with from a conscious standpoint. But the movement of the planets and the stars, uh, it's actually showing us the seasons and the, the movement of our own soul through space and time. And this is what the ancients knew. If we could make the connection between our soul's arrival on earth and how the planets and stars were revolving around that pivotal choice, we could always understand where the benefit of our creation lies. So these um, uh, symbols, we'll call them teachings even, or um, uh, representations of the universe, uh, they're a reminder to us of how we are always being led and how that leading is being done in um, an orchestrated fashion, uh, not only perfect to our own soul's evolution, but perfect to the evolution of every other being within the universe. Now, the number 13 also shows up in a lot of uh, world events uh, and secret societies tend to use it. Um, some buildings, the 13th floor is a secret floor as well. What's the significance of its use in the occult? Well, it isn't always that it is a deliberate choice. However, it is sometimes because of the sheer power of the vibration of that number. So, so if we see the 13 manifesting in a, a synchronistic fashion in a flower of life image, we must know that if we use that number, we're somehow evoking the power of the energy of the universe. So it is deliberately fashioned into things where we want to amplify the power of something or place the intention towards it in a very powerful way. Yet it, cannot be denied that the cycles of the universe and the patterns of the universe are going to show themselves in the most mysterious of ways. It isn't just uh, always in the positive because if something um, uh, of detriment is being created somewhere and that exists in the spiral of time, what we're going to find is there's always some synchronicity to how it's going to show up again on the planet or in our lives. So, so if the number 13 is prominent in a certain manifestation or being used by a certain group of humans, we can guarantee that the power of the universe is showing us something. It's either being deliberately um, forced into some manifestation that we do not desire or it's showing us the manifestation of things in a synchronistic way that, that we have the ability to actually alchemize and change, um, but the prominence of them um, is important to our soul. So if that all is the case, so are you saying that the 13 is being used or can be used in magical practices or whatever to push forth an outcome that that you wish to create even against the will of others and that's maybe why it's being used it, it certainly can but the question is can we interrupt the will of others and and that's an, an, an interesting um, conversation to have because those that understand the power of 13 or using this symbology have put collective resources behind it because they understand of course that to put this energy in motion with a specific visualization or intention can easily manifest it into being. But it does not mean that that manifestation is ever going to complicate the will of another. Level of consciousness always comes into play. So the only reason that a secret society or a group of malevolent beings would have succeeded in using the power of this number against those who did not know that they were being manipulated is because their consciousness was not high enough to understand the manipulation, in other words. 
And what you're striving for in this life is not to rely only on metaphysical tools, symbols, and properties. This is more um, a universal understanding and law that when you intersect with, even from just a knowledge base, uh, will open you up to flowing with more of your creative prowess. Um, uh, in other words, instead of using it to direct something in your life that you believe is important or, or must be done uh, to inflict, um, uh, to affect something else, simply bringing that flow of energy into your life, uh, it, it creates a coherent field. So the more we study um, these designs or symbols, the more we understand them, the more we, we intersect with them visually, the more we're naturally going to find ourselves in a coherent energy that raises our consciousness, brings in from the source field things that are necessary for us to keep evolving. For example, um, we will see synchronicity more clearly and immediate manifestations that come from that because that is our true nature. <laughs> we are here not to force things into being, but but to have a constant connection to the source field that brings us easily the things necessary for us to live the lives that we have always deemed important. So this perhaps is the greatest reminder of what this tool can offer. Why then um, has in the popular consciousness anyway, we've been convinced that the 13th or Friday the 13th as an example is an unlucky number? Well, this is very much like the translations of the Bible that are attempting to dissuade you and um, um, lower the vibration of what you understand to be true. Um, the number 13 is not a negative number whatsoever, uh, nor is any number truly um, throughout history. Uh, everything has a purpose and some universal energy and history behind it. It is just that 13 is showing us a relationship to the universe that is a very valuable one that if used by those with the right, um, we'll say focus and knowledge, um, could accelerate power in the wrong direction. And the more humans tap into the, the energy of the flower of life, the more, um, we'll say the less, they will be hampered by those who are using it in uh, negative ways. I'd like to sort of review some of the things that you said and then uh, go from there. So if we, so essentially using Metatron's cube, or the flower of life, we are helping to bring into being those things that were already part of our plan in this life or whatever we came here to accomplish. So if we are currently off track or challenged in a particular way using these, um, these uh, sacred geometric symbols will help us to bring us closer into alignment with our intentions through the universe. Is that correct? That's accurate, but we would like to add a caveat here because your divine plan it can manifest in multiple dimensions. So even though you're tuning into a flower of life image, for example, or the Metatron's cube, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the only consideration in manifesting and expressing your highest potential because there are components of belief, there are considerations of consciousness, there are um, aspects of vibration that, that all must be um, understood. Um, so, so we'll give you an example. If in desperation, you are attempting to change something in your life, like heal the physical body from a chronic disease, but you are doing so from such a state of lower vibration and density that the universe does not seem to grant your wish. It is typically because the, the images you are using or the way you are using them um, are, are attuned to your own experience, the one you are creating right now, not the one that is the highest potential. So, so to really use these to the fullest extent, to our, to our highest benefit, 
we somewhat have to be um, unattached or, or unconditional uh, in how the universe presents to us these various outcomes. Um, we do not know the reason our soul is going through a specific experience, nor do we know the timing uh, of the contracts that are involved in that experience, meaning other souls that are meant to have it with us. And these are all things that is secret societies understood. So, so in using these tools, what we're attempting to do is, is raise consciousness to the highest level while allowing the universal flow around us to bring us what matches it. And, and this is where they can be of the greatest benefit. So by using these symbols in a passive way is what you're saying without resistance, which could be as simple as having them on a wall in your environment. It's not really requiring or rather not requiring, but you don't have to meditate with it or in any other practical spiritual practice. Correct. We, 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 we agree, although we don't want to dissuade those who feel a natural ease or organic urge to work with them in a meditative way, uh, nor to use some type of specific intention. Our only suggestion is that you, you broaden the scope of what you are intending in the first place, meaning if you are too narrow in your request or, or attempting to bring something in that truly isn't meant for you, um, you may receive it because this symbol, this universal symbol, it's very powerful, uh, but it may not arrive truly in the form that you imagine is best for you and may cause you to divert from something else that was truly meant for the better. Okay, just to sort of encapsulate a few ideas together. So Metatron's cube is being used, or even the idea of the number 13, as we discussed earlier, is being used by secret societies and in magical practices to manifest things that people are intending to manifest, but uh, may, they may not necessarily be in alignment with what their soul intended, and they may even be causing harm, but nonetheless, the tool is powerful enough to create that. But what you're saying is, if we use it in a passive, um, non-resistant way, it will allow the natural flow of our whatever soul's journey we came here to manifest to happen with more ease. Is that correct? That, that's a correct determination. So keeping that idea in mind, what you were saying earlier was, let's say 10 versions of you that are 10 different levels of consciousness who are all having the same human experience if those 10 versions were to use Metatron's cube or the flower of life, it would bring them more without an intention, without a expectation, with non-resistance, would bring all 10 versions of you into alignment with your soul's journey that you came here to express. However, because you're at 10 different consciousnesses, it may express very differently for each of the 10 people. Does that make any sense? It does. And, and again, remember the considerations that we've brought to your attention. It, it is not just consciousness, but, but sometimes it is how a soul perceives the world. Uh, it is how they perceive their role in the world. Uh, there are subconscious beliefs that exist as waveform beneath the surface that are skewing the perceptions and intentions of a soul. So, so all of these things do play in to the use of these tools, while at the same time, it's important to note that they can actually be used to, to rid the self of these things. So, so the more open that you are to interfacing with this, we'll say technology, uh, without any um, uh, narrow perception as to what it must do for you, uh, the more benefit you will actually receive or you will reap the rewards of interacting with it in the highest and best way possible. And then this may be just to reiterate what you already said, but um, so if we use this tool, this technology in a passive way, such as just having it on a wall in our environment, over time, what are the results or the potential benefits? Just a greater sense of well-being and a sort of synchronistic flow way of living life? Well, there are, there are many benefits. And um, consider if it was just 
placed in your space without any direct daily meditative interface, it would actually change the flow of the space. And, and we see this as being a, a, a problem in and of itself. Uh, many of you are living in environments and spaces where the universal connections have been broken, meaning you're truly not able to access the uh, sheer amount of of cosmic energy necessary or even available to you to live your life in the most positive of ways. Even the body, for example, may suffer in these environments because the flow of energy has been somehow hampered or interrupted. This technology can clear space, align space, help the energy in the space to flow in a more connective way. In fact, it may even begin to feel as if you are living in a portal, but do not let this uh, hamper your decision to bring it in for many today are in fear of portals becoming negative or corrupted. And the flower of life pattern is not a, a portal vibration that is able to be um, tampered with. In other words, even though some who know how to use it are using it to manifest things on the planet that are not the highest and best for humanity, they could never open a portal using that technology that would cause harm, even as much as they tried. Because this pattern, um, again, uh, an unbroken connection to the universe in infinity is the purest connection that we can establish. So another uh, advantage of this that you may notice is uh, heightened consciousness, perception, and communication with things unearthly. Uh, meaning even in your space, you may begin to communicate beyond the veil. Uh, time traveled events and dream state may become very active. Meditative states become easier to access. Even at times, what we notice is uh, guides and beings assigned directly to a soul's um, uh, physical life uh, are more audible um, and easier felt and, and understood. But sometimes a soul is going through a very difficult period where it's struggling with the body, relationships, finance, whatever it may be. And we know there is a need to want to use something like the Metatron's Cube to override that period. It is not designed to clear the energy of the experience that you're having. It's designed to make the timeline more synchronistic. So imagine if you are um, in lack of, of resource and all of a sudden you notice in your peripheral things presenting themselves to you that are easy access to resource. These are things that you may have missed simply because the experience you were having was so dense that it brought your vibration down and your consciousness could not assume to see the beauty and the orchestration of the source field and the universe because you're always being taken care of. It does not mean that the amount of money that you want is going to come in in the exact necessary requirement because remember, there are things that are meant to still be a great mystery about our soul's plan. But, but in a heightened state of awareness, in a field that is perpetuating onto itself a, a pattern of symmetry. We are bound to see how the universe is here to support us in every moment. And does it matter what wall you put it on in your environment? A, a lot of sacred geometry is said to be better on certain walls or north, south, east, west, for example. In, in our determination, it, it truly changes quite a bit because of the pole shifts and the changes within Mother Earth. So it is apt to be decided by the soul who is using it and intuitively felt and changed as necessary. Meaning the intuition that you have about where the symbol goes uh, should always be trusted. And if you feel that a change has been made in the environment or you're being called to move it to a different space, uh, you should trust that as well. The more that you are in close proximity to these technologies, we'll call them, the more you become one with their consciousness because they are truly consciousness uh, 
they are truly conscious. They are a, a living consciousness, in other words. And they will speak to you, uh, not in audible words that you may hear, but, but certainly in mysterious ways that are very detectable uh, internally or externally. And these are things we advise you should follow. Now you mentioned its use in attracting abundance or um, a good fortune. Uh, the Sri Yantra is used for that. Is it is that sort of a similar vibration as Metatron's cube? It is more an amplified state of it, in other words. Um, we see this as a, a more cosmic symbol expressing itself in multiple dimensions. Even though the Metatron's cube is a universal symbol that is doing the same, this cosmic interpretation is of a more intense nature, not something necessarily found within the physical body, but nonetheless an imprint of the light that exists at the level of the DNA. So, so it's calling up within you a more um, cosmic connection uh, than what we would say the flower of life or Metatron's cube is doing, creating um, a, a quantum window or a bridge to Akashic information and energy necessary to support not only your environment and space, but also your body and your um, creative energy. Okay, let me sort of encapsulate some ideas from various conversations I've had on these shows. So are you saying uh, the Sri Yantra is kind of a modification or uh, of the uh, Metatron's cube or flower of life energy where uh, similar to how um, in Tantra, the breath is the foundational energy, but the different sexual positions are focusing that energy for different outcomes. Or for example, with Kundalini, the breath being the foundational energy, whereas the mudras can be used to focus that energy toward different outcomes. Is this a relationship at all? Well, we could we could agree with this, of course. Um, think of it more as a light code, one that has been created specifically to create um, uh, a bridge between the earth and the universe, whereby uh, that pranic energy of the universe is accessible and able to be put into efficient use in the area in which you have chosen uh, to place it. So Sri Yantras is an example were created as a modification essentially of this universal potential that's in the flower of life for human purposes such as uh, wealth or abundance or something like that. Uh, I noticed the Sri Yantra pattern in three-dimensional form is also used in uh, ancient buildings like Angkor Wat, for example, is a three-dimensional Sri Yantra. So was that to bring that sort of good fortune into that environment, that physical environment? Well, let's discuss this in terms of the 369. The 369 pattern making an unbroken connection to the universe. This is something that exists within many portals and pyramids and temples. But the design that you are speaking of takes that 369 pattern, turns it into a sound and amplifies it. So in other words, it's bringing universal energy into space in a more, um, you know, we'll say in a higher vibrational way, in a, in a, in a uh, adopted frequency that goes beyond what it would normally arrive within. So if we were to create um, these three-dimensional versions of, let's say the Sri Yantra or the Flower of Life or um, uh, Metatron's Cube, we would imbue that potential into that physical space. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and uh, we see no barrier to this, in, in other words, uh, other than the soul that is attempting to use it in a specific way, meaning any limitation that you put upon it uh, is going to um, show itself as a limitation. Thank you. That's all for today. Right. And thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us for another Channel Revelation show. You can also find us on various podcast platforms like Apple or Google or Spotify, for example. 
And we'll see you next week for a Awaken Empowered podcast. Thank you.